Iran. Let me put this on speaker. Is it safe to talk to safe today? <laughs> yes, it is. But you sound different. I'm in a different realm. Oh, what a surprise. I did not expect to hear from you. Well, I'm not there. I'm here. In order to have a dialogue, we must first be suspicious of those perceived boundaries between space and time. How can you be calling? Strange, huh? Have you forgotten what you said in your own writings? Oh, the illusion of absolute boundaries between space and time. Hmm. The boundaries separating the past from the future is shifting. It moves as we try to state it. As in answering the question, what time is it? By the time we answer, it's either not arrived or past. Well, the notion of here is a togetherness of many years that indicates a before and after. And the notion of now seems to have ceased to be in the act of pointing at time. Hirsch said, the present is half past and half future. The past, the present, and the future are considered a synchronic, indivisible triad. But how does this relate to the boundaries between the living and the dead? I think what you really mean is the separation of the no longer living from the not yet dead. The further separation of the not yet dead from the not yet living. The dead define the past, the not yet living the future, and the not yet dead the present. You shared this course with many who died, creating relations beyond here and now. Well, the notion of relation is central to experience and understanding, real or imagined. Discourse is exclusively a universe of objects, but objects of which some are identical with things. Unlike things, objects in every instance involve a relation to an organism through which they exist as experienced objects. Hirsch said, the universe is perfused with signs if it's not composed exclusively of signs. So the present as half past and half future includes those already dead, the not yet dead and the not yet living. It is reasonable to suggest then the boundary between the living and the dead is self-imposed illusion. Persis says personal existence is an illusion and a practical joke. Exactly. The universe of things exceeds the universe of objects and sometimes presents itself as a world of just things. Yet the universe of objects exceeds the universe of things. Things can exist objectively or not at all or not in the same way physically as a mind-independent being. The role of signs is the only path that we have to apprehend objects and things because experience transcends physical reality. So experiencing reality is based not only on facts, but also on belief and imagination. Imagination is not to be found in the distinction between the real and the unreal. Well, Farouk, as we've learned, what's true can become untrue. Before Galileo, common sense had people believing that the earth was the center of the universe and the sun revolved around it. Reality is not only a question of what is, but as well of what could be, what should be, and what in the future will be. Indeed, because for Columbus would have fallen off the edge of the flat earth. We strive to recreate our reality, a shift from common sense to uncommon sense overcomes our perception of the boundaries between true and untrue. Well, your notion of uncommon sense connects with Peirce's idea of pure play of amusement. Amusement is a moderate indulgence of play and has no purpose unless recreation. I think what Peirce meant by purpose refers to the scientific research. As he said, 
If our observations and reflections are allowed to specialize too much, play is converted into scientific study. So the pure play of amusement is more than scientific research. Play of amusement transcends this research through what I call design inquiry and is open for unexpected outcomes. The play of amusement prepares human beings to continue playing with boundaries, not within boundaries. Boundaries are something that we need to understand are neither fixed nor absolute. John, I thought you were to be with us longer. You departed too soon. Well, when you saw me in Latrobe last year, I thought I would have 10 or 15 more years to live. That was my reactionary, finite mind. In crossing the boundary between life and death, I realized that I'll always be here and there, now and then, living life semiotically. My physical existence is not here and now, but my soul and thoughts are here in my writings. There's a gloomy notion that a man cannot be in two places at once, as though he were a thing. But in actuality, how can I carry on conversations with you? Ah, that's the paradox between things and objects. Experience does not begin with things. Sensation begins with things. Experience begins with the perception of objects from which we discover things. Of course, in modern thought, object and thing have become synonymous. Incorrectly so, they are not. To be an object simply means to be known. To be a thing means to have subjective dimension, to exist independent of being known. A good example is the difference between Hamlet and Napoleon. There was a time when you could shake hands with Napoleon. There was never a time you could shake Hamlet's hand. So, John, as John, are you an object of awareness or a physical thing that once was? Aha, I'm both. In the case of Hamlet, there was not subjectivity, only objectivity. I was once a physical being, a thing, existing in relation to finite minds. Then I became an object of awareness. As an object, I'm in your mind as a mental image of memories and experience. As a thing, I'm dead. As an object, I'm alive, and you know how and where to find me. Wait, wait a second. You are not alive. How do I carry on conversation? Your time is up. Your time is up. Crossing the boundary between the realm of the living and the dead reminds me of the experience I was not prepared to endure when Tom Sibiak died or when I lost my son Matthew in a tragic car accident. Before I faced my own mortality, for me, it was a proof of something seemingly abstract, my mortality. Sadly, some family, friends, and colleagues have departed too soon. Yes, and you've experienced that also. I know how devastated you were receiving the heartbreaking news of the death of your brother while at the semiotic meeting in Pittsburgh. I believe this is a transition, a metamorphosis from one stage to the next. I do not know that's true. I only have no evidence that is not. Well, Peirce said, we seem to lock the human body in the box of flesh and blood. Again, how can I continue our conversation? Think about it. Words can be used as a bridge joining us. In death, carnal consciousness passes away. Peirce's cynicism recognizes carnal consciousness as but a small part of man. Farouk, you wrote about that paradox of life and death in your dialogue with Kishta. That was after she died, wasn't it? Yeah, really, it wasn't difficult to imagine a dialogue with other than human animal. Well, Peirce extended imagination beyond humans. The word dialogue implies a movement toward the other. 
crossing over, and transcending boundaries. Imagining a dialogue with me in the realm of the dead is perfectly appropriate based on that. But how do I know I am not just engaging in a monologue? Uh, fortunately, you have access to all my writings. That presents multiple selves listening to each other, engaging in dialogue. You find not just responses, but you also will join me in dialogical relations. Oh, what a relief. That links this conference theme, the signs of play and the play of signs. What a playful way to connect. Wow. This allows us to reconstruct a new reality beyond boundaries. Absolutely. These links, these reconstructions, are associations whereby one object imagined can connect with another object ad infinitum. For signs to exist, life must exist. And for life to exist, signs need to exist. As you know, Peirce also says the highest grade of reality is only reached by signs. Semiosis is rooted in imagination, not bound by limitations external to it. We can imagine whatever we please. Imagination can create any object and link them in any way. We are conscious of the world as being more than ourselves. We experience others whose body no longer emits signs of life through imaginary dialogue every day. But, uh, the nagging question, how can I carry on conversation with you beyond the grave? Uh, simply at the spa. Oh, at the spa? <laughs> this is funny, John. We all know you love to take bath, and most often than not, there is more water on the floor than in the bathtub. Farouk, why do you take my words literally? Well, uh, the word the spa itself means fountain, and goes back to ancient Egyptians where taking a bath was considered as a physical and spiritual purification. It is the purifying and the healing properties of water in which we must strip out of our pretense, sweat out our biases, and let our consciousness relax and liberate us from absolute reality. Oh, not quite. You're a hundred percent wrong. That's not what I meant. Oh, excuse me, John. But, but, but what do you mean by SPA? SPA is my acronym for Sibioc, Huanso, and Aquinas. The company I'm now pleased to be with. What a great company. Of course. Anyone can engage with me in a dialogical relation. Relation is not just subject to subject. There is no such thing as relation in the sense of an actual ens reale. Only in awareness do relations arise between or among objects. But the order of things as things contains no such thing as relations. Uh, what? You lost me, John. This is important. Pay close attention. The relation between us is per force over and above both of us. It unites our unique subjectivities. To do that, it must be supra-subjective. For example, when I taught in Mexico, the outcome of my interactions with Mexican colleagues was the beginning of my book, The Four Ages. Those interactions traversed many boundaries across space, time, academia, and nationalism. That relationship could not be seen, heard, touched, or perceived directly by my senses. Relation is the most elusive of all the ways of being, often not recognized as reality. Now, I couldn't physically be at your conference. This is not a surprise. I'm no longer anywhere in your perceived space and time. But I do not cease to be an object in relation to your subjectivity. Therefore, I exist after death. 
although a relation can be real, true, or imaginary, huh, our dialogues cannot be over lunch or some wine as we used to. Relations cannot be reduced to that interaction. They only arise from the interaction. Interaction requires physical contact, but that contact is not the relation. It merely allows the relation to begin. Relations are like a child that results from sexual intercourse. The intercourse requires physical contact, but the child that results exists over and above that contact and continues to exist when the contact is over. Very convincing example, John, thank you. So my relations with you are no longer dependent on actual contact. Exactly. What's remarkable about relations is their permeability to the otherwise distinct orders of what does and what does not exist independently of the finite mind. Relations are the heart of semiosis. Interactions cease. Relations live on and continue. Relations are indifferent to distance in space or time. Relations are independent of interactions. Relations require subjects, others, and me. What defines a relation is not intersubjectivity, but rather suprasubjectivity. Relations depend upon some subjectivity as a foundation, but the relation itself is over and above that subjectivity. So relations continue through imaginary dialogue. That's semiosis. It involves not only relations of imagination, but physical relations as well. Hirsch said, every man who does accomplish great things is giving to building elaborate castles in the air, imagination, and then painfully copying them on solid ground, the thing. Indeed, the business of rationalization making us intellectual beings, is performed in our imagination. For Peirce, the imagination of pure play of amusement must not be constrained by logical analyses. Imagination is the freeway uniting mental and physical means. Oh, you bringing me to Peirce's metaphor. His metaphor said it all. Enter your skiff of amusement. Push off into the lake of thought and leave the breath of heaven to swell your sail. With your eyes open, awake to what is about or within you, and open conversation with yourself. Precisely. We exist through dialogical relationships with others. Oh, this reminds me of Vico's notion of imagination, a distinctive feature of human mind enabling us to form mental images from memories and experiences. Exactly. Memory, imagination, and estimation are what create human awareness. Oh, we can use memories to create imaginary dialogues and recreate future interactions and ultimately generate relations. We can organize our experience to meaningfully make sense of the paradoxes of life and persevere through them. All are free to have an imaginary dialogue with me or with those still living. This is significant in the development of semiotics. Hearst underscores the importance of imaginative activities to create new knowledge, imagination. Through the triadic relation of signs, the human mind is capable of perceiving the significance of transdisciplinary knowledge. Oh, creating knowledge is much more than arriving at expected fact or truth, serving specialized autonomous disciplines. True knowledge, I believe, is interdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary. Sibiak emphasized that semiotics provides the only means of transdisciplinary integration. But, John, one problem has been considering semiotic as the science of science rather than the doctrine of science. 
John Locke called it the new branch of human knowledge. Uh, but uh, as you know, all the habits die hard. John, I believe Peirce's philosophy is certainly a transmodern. It has, indeed, moved beyond modernity and postmodernity. Peirce's transmodern philosophy changed the epistemological limitations that we had and has penetrated the dead end of absolute reality and autonomous disciplines. I recognized your idea that Peirce is indeed in philosophy the first of the truly postmodern thinkers, but he has achieved that status as you established while being thoroughly transmodern as well. Oh, thank you, John. Let me reiterate what I said in the Four Ages. Semiotics is not mere postmodern as a style of fashion, but it is postmodern in principle. But, 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 but you are not suggesting this a kind of general semantics, I should say, are you? I understand that the map is not at the territory, but even if postmodern is just a word, the way we use words control the way we think and act. Words are important. You're absolutely right. Do you know the story of Alfred Korsbiski? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. He tricked his students to eat dog cookies by changing the package label to biscuit for humans. You see, we cannot use old words to express the new paradigm. However, the challenge is to say something new, either we have to use new words or use old words in a new ways. <laughs> in either case, we can hardly avoid creating misunderstandings. And those misunderstandings are significant and how we deal with them. New ways of thinking require new ways of speaking. As you said, either old words used in new ways, which risks misunderstanding, since the old words dispose the hearer to think in old ways, or new words introduced, which run the risk of alienating, since the new words discomfort the hearer by forcing an encounter with the unfamiliar. Small wonder culture as we know it, including intellectual culture, is resistant to change. You, you see, transmodernity does not reject either modernity or postmodernity. It transcends them. In this transmodern world, everything co-evolves in a transparent manner. There is no place for absolute real, true, or imaginary. Although we perceive reality where we only see related things, there are many relations are invisible to our senses, as you indicated many times. Well, conceiving these invisible relations among real, true, imaginary, and imaginary, is our hope for transdisciplinary knowledge. Well, regardless of how you describe it, postmodern or transmodern, as my beloved Brooke maintained, will in all probability someday bear a more clearly defining name at a distinct period in human history other than postmodern. Yet who can presume to name any era, much less one's own era, for all time? I remember once you said the study of science is the study of the world, a world in which new possibilities emerge in a given present, affecting and changing what may or will be possible in the future. The theme of this conference paves the way for meaningful dialogues between the living and the dead, with the potential for transforming the current status of semiotics into future actuality. Well, I spent my life trying to introduce semiotics to a larger audience. I've come to realize that I will not see the results of the work in my lifetime. When I wrote Semiotic Scene Synchronically, I dedicated to semioticians of the 22nd century. I did that specifically because I think it will take at least that long for the academic world to figure out how to incorporate semiotics 
into the intellectual culture in our universities. Well, you have also helped many semiotations capture the essence of being human, capable of recognizing the elusive boundaries of reality through imagination. The interesting thing about semiotic reality is that the boundaries are never fixed. They're always shifting. This is the key realization for this postmodern or transmodern humanism. We must consider the possibility that future interpretations may change the past and present interpretations. Thinking through signs will influence the future, so the meaning of the past is shaped by the influence of the future. Granted, we can't know what actual past semiotics will take. All we can do within the spiral of semiosis is consciously try to influence its development. But, but you, you see, John, this influence of the future cannot take place except by design. In this transmodern world, human beings are able to traverse the diaphanous boundaries among disciplines by bridging the gap between the humanities and sciences. I'm so happy that you're continuing tirelessly to try to connect design and semiotics. Well, uh, as, as you know, both design and semiotics involve imagination that resonate with Peirce's notion of the two worlds in which we live, <laughs> a world of fact and a world of imagination that allows us to play with science, reframing perceived problems and preparing us to use signs of play, allowing unexpected outcome to emerge. I'm somewhat amazed by your work. It seems so, so accurate that design and semiotics are together since they stem from imagination together. Well, John, uh, your work <laughs> inspires the full integration of design and semiotics. Enough business. How's my beloved Brooke, my collaborator and editor? Her devotion to my philosophical work was a gift of timeless love. Well, John, timeless love transcends space and time. I miss her so much. The human soul, my friend, is immortal, capable of continuing subjectivity even when the body is destroyed. Don't spend time celebrating my life in a grand matter. Rather celebrate the work that we're doing and see that work flourish. John, your great work and compassionate nature will shine through generations. Just as my ancient Egyptians believe, the soul resides in a space-time-free reality where imaginary dialogue is always possible. Farouk, I have only one request. Honor living semioticians, because honoring them now creates the relationship that can exist once they die. Will do. We will always honor you as a great philosopher, semiotician, and a compassionate human being. You played with many boundaries across space and time. Brooke summed up saying, how we can continue to see light from a star even after the star is no longer exist. Farewell, my friend. <laughs>